Hello, welcome to another YAM3D tutorial. Today we're animating text with Blender Geometry Nodes. Geometry Node is a very unique tool for animating text because it gives you access to low-level geometries like all the faces, edges, vertices, making it easy to animate them individually. You can often create visually complex animations with a simple setup and a bit of math. In this tutorial, we'll do exactly that. We'll be creating this looping animation that might look quite intricate, but has a straightforward node setup. I mean, just look at these. These are all the nodes we'll be using. We'll first generate the text mesh and tweak its topology. Then we'll animate the scale of the faces with the noise. And finally, we will cover tips and tricks to make things just a bit more polished and intriguing. All right, let's dive in. All right, let's create a new Blender scene. For this tutorial, I'm using Blender 4.1.1. Um, go to Geometry Nodes Workspace, click on the Z-axis so that we're looking down at the x y plane. I'm going to put a Geometry Node on the default cube and call it Animate Text. So we'll drop down a String to Curves node and enter some text here, for instance, Hello. You can click on this folder icon to pick your favorite font file to use for the text. And we have text. So we actually get curved instances here, so we can use a realize instances node to convert them into real geometry. Now if you look at the spreadsheet, we actually have splines with control points. Now I can simply put a fill curve node to get a filled out mesh, but if we look at the wireframe of this mesh, the distribution is pretty horrible. We have a lot more faces near the curved areas uh, and a lot fewer faces in the straight areas. To fix this, let's get rid of the field curve for now. All right, so I'm gonna use a curve to mesh and then use a split edges node to split up the individual edges in the mesh. What this means is now we'll have an edge that goes from here to here, another one that goes from here to here, another one that goes from here, and so on. So we will get a bunch of endpoints that are all overlapping, but they're not the same point. And this is going to be important when later we distribute points on the splines. Um, we actually get to preserve the sharp corners of our text by doing this. All right. Now with edges all split up, we can convert things back to curves. So let's do a mesh to curve. And uh, I'm going to resample the curve with a resample curve node. And as for the resample count, the longer a spline is, the more points I want there to be. So I'm going to use a spline length node and connect the length to a multiply. And we can basically use the other factor as a density control slider. I'm going to take the maximum of that value and 2, connect the value to count. So this ensures that we have at least two points for each spline. All right. To visualize the point distribution on our curves, we can drop down an instance on points and feed an icosphere as the instance. I'm going to change the radius of the icosphere to something smaller, and voila, here you can see these are all the points on our curves. Cool, let's get rid of this. Now, uh, with the curve resampled, let's convert it back to a mesh, the curve to mesh. I'm going to use a merge by distance to join the overlapping endpoints back together. This way, when we do mesh to curve again, we can use a field curve node to finally get a more evenly filled out mesh. So admittedly, there are quite a few nodes to convert back and forth between meshes and curves and meshes and curves. But this is the best way I've found to uh, get more evenly distributed faces while also preserving the shape of the text. Now you can actually uh, play around with the multiply factor here to get more faces or fewer faces. And as you can see, this value only impacts the straight areas. And to change up the density around the curves, you can actually go to the first curve to mesh and drop down 
a set spline resolution node. By default, this is 12, but if you tweak it, you can see um, you can put more points around the curved areas. For now, I'm just going to leave it at the default 12. All right, before things get messy, let's move this out of the way and put this nose into a node group and call this prepare mesh and connect it to the output. Now, we're almost ready to start animating, but before that, we need a few more setup. So, I want to store with each point two things. First is the center position of the face that it belongs to. Second, I want an offset vector that would move the center to the point itself. All right, how do we do this? Let's drop down a store named attribute node. For the center, we're going to store a vector called center, and its value can be simply uh, be evaluated as the position on the face domain. And fun fact, in Blender, the position of the face is actually its center, which is very handy. Now to calculate the offset, we can duplicate this node, rename the attribute to offset, and for value, we're going to connect it to a subtract node to take the difference between the point position itself and this named attribute called center that we have just created. So this is a vector called center. All right. Why do we want these two values? Well, with them, we can now set the position of each vertex as the sum of the center and the offset. So if we add the two together, we get the original mesh back. Big surprise. <laughs> but the fun part is if we uh, scale the offset with a scale factor, we can uh, start scaling the faces towards their individual center. And actually, we forgot to do one thing earlier. So let's go back to the prepare mesh node group. Uh, in the very end, let's add a split edges node. So this breaks up the edges and chop the mesh into individual faces. Now, if we go back to the scale factor, we can scale the faces individually. Sweet. All right, now we're ready for some animation action. So we're going to use a syntime node. Connect the frame to a divide, um, put 120 as the other value. So this will be the total number of frames in our animation. We want it to match the end frame on the timeline here. If we feed the value to the scale and play the animation, the scale is starting to animate. All right, so one thing that looks a bit jarring is as soon as the face scale reaches one, it snaps back to zero, which is not the most smooth. So to fix that, we can connect the skill to a float curve and tweak the curve so that it starts and ends both at one. But then in the middle, I wanted to uh, scale down to zero, tweak the opening of this dip so that uh, it scales down really fast and then balloons back up. It should look something like this. You see, our face are now doing uh, this. Now all of our faces are scaling in unison, but we can offset the motion on individual face with a noise. So go to this divide node right after some time. Let's put it into a frame uh, called normalize time. We can offset this time factor with an add and a fraction. So the fraction node kind of takes the fraction node part of the value and keeps the value within zero to one range. And if we connect this to the float curve and start playing the animation, we can use this other value as a time offset. Now, if we do a noise texture, change the dimension to 40, and then for the noise position, we're gonna feed it a named attribute called center. So this is the center of the face, and then connect the factor to the time offset, and just play the animation. There, you can already see that um, our scaling is being broken up by this noise pattern. All right, a few things to make the animation appear more dynamic. 
So right after the noise structure, we can actually fit it to another flow curve node and connect it to the add here. Uh, let's call this one offset time. And we can tweak this curve so that the noise is distributed differently. Why is that? Well, if we preview the output and feed this offset value as the value to preview, you can actually see that there are different shades of gray. So this is the different time offsets we are feeding to our face motion. So all the parts with the same brightness will be moving with the same timing. If we tweak the curve back to something that's more linear, you can see everything falls into this gray value area, uh, which means they're more or less moving around the same time. But if we tweak the curve to um, make the value range wider, essentially more contrast, now the time offset is more spread out. There's almost always a part of the text that is moving, which may or may not be what you want. I'm just going to keep tweaking this parameter until I get something I'm happy with. I'm going to change up the skill of the noise, which also has a big impact on the feel of the motion. But we can also tweak the W value to offset the noise. All right, I think I'm happy with something like this. All right, here's another thing that we can tweak. Now, if we look at the value we're feeding to the offset scale, this comes from a flow curve, which means it's a value that goes from zero to one. It doesn't have to be. So if we feed it to a map range node and change the minimum value of the target range to negative 0.5, play the animation, you can see that we're getting this interesting pattern that is almost turning the triangle inside out. Why is that? Well, if you recall how we are compute the point position, we are adding the center and the offset together. So for each face, we have three points. We have a center and we have an offset that points to these three points. Now, if we scale the offset with a negative value, they start to point in the opposite direction, and that effectively inverts the triangle. It turns it inside out. I think this looks pretty cool, as it just adds a bit more um, complexity to the style. All right, one final tip. So now we're feeding a noise pattern to the time offset here. It doesn't have to be a noise pattern. In fact, it can simply be a random number. So if we drop down a random value, um, we want to use the same random value for every point on the same face. So to do that, we're going to feed the ID to a evaluate on domain, change the domain to face, and then feed the value to ID. So this gives us the same ID value for every point on the same face. If we feed the random value to the time offset and start playing the animation, you can see that we get a different randomness spread. So the thing with building motion with randomness is you kind of develop an eye for what different random and noise pattern looks like. And this, my friend, is a classic evenly distributed random value. <laughs> and if we connect the noise back, this is um, what a noise distribution would look like. So here's the cool part. We don't really have to choose between a noise and a evenly distributed random value. We can actually mix the two together. So if we drop down a mix and connect the noise output and the random value as the two inputs to the mix, um, feed the output back to the time offset, now we can almost use this factor slider to decide how heavily we lean on the noise or the random. So if this is completely zero, this is fully using the noise, but if this is one, this is fully using the random distribution. So if we leave it at something like 0.15, this is leaning heavily on the noise, but it mixes a little bit of randomness to the noise so that it breaks it up a little bit, which I think looks really, really cool.
All right, with that, we're done with the tutorial. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. I think this is a simple yet elegant setup that shows how complex visuals can be built from simple ideas. Leave a comment if you have questions or suggestions. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.